run-up to SmackDown 1000, wrestling fans took time to remember the biggest moments and brightest stars from the blue brand's two decades of existence. One constant among that ongoing flood of memories was Edge, whose turn as the gleefully opportunistic scumbag a decade ago gave SmackDown a perfect villain. At different times, we saw Adam Joseph Copeland playing the parts of muted street urchin, gothic lackey, camera-friendly goofball, and wise-cracking good guy. To watch Edge develop into one of WWE's most supreme heels was a bit surprising, but it was a pleasant surprise at that. And that's not to disparage his obvious talents. Edge had long won us over with his furniture-based mayhem, his comically enthusiastic turns on made-up words, and his knack for delivering bigger and better matches with each passing year. But it takes a very special performer to be a cut above, to perfect the art of demented douchebaggery like Edge did, the scoundrel that we all deserve. You won't need flash photography to enjoy this list that salutes the rated R superstar, nor could we relegate such a dedication to a mere five seconds. You think you know Edge? You'll know him better by the end of this list. I'm Sam from Cultaholic.com, and these are 10 things you didn't know about Edge. Join us! Number 10. The Stars Align Like you and I, Edge consumed professional wrestling at a rapid rate in his younger days. If it involved a three-roped ring, he wanted to watch whatever happened inside of it. Whether it was Canadian broadcasts of Stampede and Maple Leaf Wrestling, or WWE's American broadcasts, or the Minnesota-based AWA promotion. And he wasn't the only elementary school lad in Orangeville, Ontario that loved wrestling. A new kid in his school named Jason Riso, who would obviously go on to become Christian, was a die-hard fan of the Graps as well. But wrestling wasn't what initially drew the two together. In young Edge's eyes, what totally reeked of awesomeness about young Christian was that he owned a ninja star. The undoubtedly cool object drew Edge to his future kayfabe brother, and soon after, they realized that they were both obsessed with all things wrestling. A friendship was almost immediately struck between the two that carries through more than three decades later, with millions of miles and aches accumulated by two good-natured Canadian kids that chased a shared dream. Number 9. Royal Treatment Not every wrestler can be Ronda Rousey having their first match on the WrestleMania stage while simultaneously tossing WWE's corporate offices around like sandbags. No, most most first match stories are a little bit more humbling, and Edge is certainly no exception. Granted, he did receive wrestling schooling in a most interesting fashion, having won an essay contest where first prize was the opportunity to be trained by veteran grapplers Sweet Daddy Siki and Ron Hutchison. Edge would have his first match on July 1st, 1992 as part of an outdoor Canada Day celebration in Toronto. And said first match was a battle royal, notable for Edge wearing Zuba's pants and Converse sneakers as part of his get-up. Edge would note that he made it to the final four of the Battle Royal, but sadly was not victorious on that day. He does, however, also note that his being horrified of the audience seeing him in such lackluster gear made him promise to acquire more professional ring attire going forward. I don't get what the problem with that gear is, though. I want some Zubas. They look comfy AF. Somebody send me some. Number 8. Early Strike The name Edge has a simple ring to it, one syllable, but conveys both coolness and toughness alike. It's certainly less wordy than his earlier ring name of Sexton Hardcastle, which is quite a mouthful to say the least. But there was a time when Edge, at 22, used a different name altogether, and it came in the brief time that he wrestled for WCW. Wrestlers like Kane and Billy Gunn spent time in WCW earlier in their careers as unknown preliminary wrestlers, and Edge did the same. And as for that ring name, in early 1996, Edge wrestled a pair of televised WCW matches under the name Damon Stryker. As Stryker, Edge would lose to both the Taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan, and the ultra-frightening Meng, also known as Haku, in matches that aired on the weekend show WCW. W Pro. Coincidentally enough, in the match with Sullivan, the veteran wrestler had the Giant in his corner. Who'd have guessed that 13 years later, Damon Stryker and the Giant would be involved in a televised love triangle with Eddie Guerrero's wife? Man, wrestling is bloody strange. Number 7. Heard It On The Radio When Edge was being prepared for his run as a regular player in WWE, different ideas were volleyed about for how to present him. Edge himself wanted to be more of a serious wrestler, while creative types like Vince Russo wanted to give him a mysterious and maniacal vibe. They settled on the middle ground of letting him be a tortured soul that at least got to wear wrestling tights per Edge's wishes. But now came the important part the name. As it happened, Edge was driving in a car with Don Callis, who was at the time working for WWE as the Jackal. As the two traveled through New York State, they were listening to the vehicle's radio, which had Edge as part of its name. Callis casually suggested Edge as a wrestling name, knowing that his travel mate was still trying to come up with one. Russo, however, had previously suggested both Riot and Rage to the young wrestler, but neither fit in Adam Copeland's eyes. Edge, however, seemed to fit snugly. Number 6. A Near Washout One match can be credited for putting four future world 
champions on the map, the No Mercy 1999 ladder match. Edge, Christian and the Hardy Boys almost literally made the climb to a collective brighter future with what was arguably WWE's best match that year, stunning the fans in Cleveland as well as those watching at home with a magnificent array of stunts, bumps and drama. And Edge knew a thing or two about drama because he came very close to missing the match altogether. On the weekend of the pay-per-view, Edge found himself stranded in South Florida while Hurricane Irene tore its way up from the Gulf and into the Atlantic coastline. Edge missed the Saturday trip to WWE's Stanford facilities to plan the match with the other participants and had to scramble on event day Sunday just to make the pay-per-view. He made a dangerous mad dash drive from Miami to Tampa through the torrential storm, caught a flight into Cleveland and made it to the building just three hours before showtime. With his comrades at his side, however, he pieced the match together and the four tore the house down. Edge may have lost the match, but he won out over Mother Nature's fury that day. Number five, Bridge Builder. Though Rob Zombie's energetic Never Gonna Stop was a damn good piece of entrance music, it's hard to argue against Alter Bridge's Metalingus as the song that's most identified with Edge. Now, I'm really not a fan of Alter Bridge, but they came together in 2004, essentially just Creed with a much better lead singer, and released their debut album One Day Remains that August. Metalingus was the album's fifth track, and although not released as a single, it would become perhaps one of the band's most memorable songs. According to Alter Bridge guitarist Mark Tremonti, Edge was a fan of the group and sought their permission to use Metalingus as his entrance music. They agreed, and in fairness, it was a pretty wise move. Tremonti would say that many wrestling fans have reached out to him and his bandmates, informing them that they learned of Alter Bridge through Edge's prolific use of the song. Tremonti went on to say in a 2017 interview that they owe Edge a huge favor, which we assume will involve recording a cover of Metalingus entirely played on kazoos. Number 4. Money's Good Anywhere It may still be the greatest Money in the Bank cash-in in WWE history. The night that Edge brutalized a wounded John Cena to capture his first ever world title, the WWE Championship. Edge's second cash-in on The Undertaker 16 months later on SmackDown has its charms, but that victory on New Year's Revolution 2006 set a very high bar, one that perhaps only Seth Rollins' WrestleMania 31 cash-in has surpassed. Edge holds the distinction of being the only wrestler in WWE history to cash in Money in the Bank and win two different belts. The win over Cena gave him the WWE Championship, while the victory over Taker gave him the World Heavyweight Belt. It's also notable that each victory was Edge's first first reign with each of the belts. He also became the first man to win each of the belts via cash-ins, so he's also a trendsetter. Today, nobody has won the Universal Belt on a cash-in, so maybe that favor that Alter Bridge owes him could tie in there somehow. Number 3. A Unique Hat Trick His time spent in the ring proved to be golden for Adam Copeland, and even if you take out his actual championship victories, he still had it pretty sweet. Beginning with his King of the Ring 2001 victory, Edge would begin to earn other honors that didn't come in belt form. These include his 2005 Money in the Bank briefcase acquisition and later his 2010 Royal Rumble victory whilst coming back from an Achilles injury. With that Rumble win, Edge became the first man to win the King of the Ring tournament, a Money in the Bank briefcase and a Royal Rumble match, a feat that would not be matched for another five years. The only other man that's managed to do this is Sheamus, who completed that hat trick himself in June 2015 with his own Money in the Bank win. And chances are we'll never see somebody else match that feat unless Stone Cold shows up to a Money in the Bank match and uses the Survivor Series 2000 crane to rip the briefcase off a skyhook. Number 2. World Power As noted earlier when Edge cashed in his second briefcase to defeat The Undertaker on SmackDown in May 2007, it marked the first time that Edge held that particular championship. The belt had existed for almost five years at the time, but it eluded him during the time that he and said belt both occupied Raw. But once the wrestler and the strap migrated to SmackDown at different points, he would certainly make up for lost time. Despite becoming the 11th different man out of 25 to hold the World Heavyweight title, Edge holds the record for most different reigns with the strap, holding the gold seven times in all. That's two more reigns than the second place holder, the five won by Triple H. Edge would actually hold the belt five times in less than two years, winning his fifth at Backlash 2009. Overall, he's merely third in most combined days with the World Heavyweight title, 409 days in all. And number one, Double Trouble. We end this list by bringing it back to Edge and his pretty much brother Christian, as well as a few other big stars from Edge's time in WWE. Alongside Christian, Edge would hold WWE's World Tag Team titles on seven occasions, an impressive number unto itself. But that seven represents only half of Edge's total number of runs with Tag Team Gold under the WWE banner. In all, Edge is a 14-time former Tag Team Champion in WWE, another record. Along with the seven he held alongside Christian, Edge also reigned twice with Benoit, twice with Jericho concurrently with the Unified Belts, 
and once each with Randy Orton, Rey Mysterio, and Hulk Hogan. And it's interesting how there were Reigns representing a few of Edge's different personas, a valiant babyface hero alongside Hogan, Benoit and Rey, a scheming opportunist with Jericho and Orton, and the dorky airhead that made us all laugh alongside Christian. Clearly Edge is a man of all seasons, and his versatility inside of that ring is something that will be forever cherished. I've been Sam from Cultaholic.com, you can follow me on Twitter here, you can follow all of us at Cultaholic. If you like what we do here at Cultaholic, you can check us out on Patreon, that's patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And no matter what you do, don't ever forget to hit subscribe and join us.